So picking up on uh, Alistair McIntyre's uh, uh, newfound appreciation of, uh, of, uh, of St. Thomas, I, I call it his uh, Thomistic awakening, right? As uh, Kant, you know, credited Hume from waking him from his dogmatic slumbers. Uh, McIntyre says that he learned something about Aristotle through his reading of Aquinas, and Aquinas is present in the original uh, after uh, virtue, but you know he started thinking more and became more and more, and he sometimes refers to himself as a as a Thomist of sorts. But in any case, what 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 did he find in Thomas Aquinas? So again, very traditional stuff, right? Going back to to Aristotle and Aquinas, so you're getting more of an idea of what this vast sort of metaphysical framework that he thinks was lost, and it was essentially lost in the birth of the scientific revolution. Um, philosophy changed quite dramatically as a result of that. Um, anyways, that's a story for another time. But so what's this Thomistic awakening that, that I'm talking about? Well, there's, there's a number of points, and I'm going to simplify McIntyre's discussion. Um, essentially, he said, look, my, when, when he's claiming that when he wrote After Virtue, when it first came out, he had rejected Aristotle's biology. And Aristotle's biology has a metaphysical dimension to it. And um, then he, he, he struggled with uh, trying to provide an account of human good in, in terms of, of secular uh, concepts and political concepts, um, which Aristotle is sometimes called a, a naturalist in ethics, but his ethics links up to his metaphysics. His notion of the human good does link up to, to metaphysics. It's not really a naturalist uh, form of, uh, of ethics. Uh, it looks more natural than Plato's, that's for sure. But nonetheless, uh, Aristotle embeds a lot of metaphysics in his biology and in turn uses that to, to uh, talk about the nature of, of human good. Um, so by, by jettisoning this biology, uh, McIntyre said he struggled with sort of this completely naturalized account of human good and he found it wanting. And then he realized that somehow in his writings, he had pre presupposed a, a notion of good and he found that it was very similar to Aquinas in the uh, Summa Theologiae, uh, part one, question five, where, in, and this is in a, in a very metaphysical context, that Aquinas talks about the good. And he's, and Akhtar says, you know, uh, when I look at what, what I was doing, I realized that I had this sort of implicit Thomism in uh, what, I was, uh, what I was trying to, to say. So metaphysics, essentially, the, the takeaway at this stage, we'll look more at this later, but the takeaway is that um, you really can't ground the notion of human good in a, in a perfectly secular, corporeal context. It's not simply a political notion. It's got elements of metaphysics in it, and metaphysics has to be brought back into ethics. Now, that is something that, uh, in many ways, would uh, Kant would you know, not be happy about that. Mill would be pretty appalled. Um, and, and, you know, the consequentialist movement was to try and get away from that. Uh, think, think, certainly, if you think of people like Bentham, he, he thought that stuff would, you know, that has to be jettisoned. Okay, so metaphysics comes back in and, you know, a really old style, like in, in, in an Aquinian kind of framework, not identical, but in that manner, and with that remains to be unpacked. Um, that, uh, and, and, and another thing is that he realized, Maktar that is, realized that even his account of humans as virtuous needed also a kind of biological foundation. And in this sense, not Aristotle's view of biology. So not only metaphysics and biology uh, have to, not only metaphysics has to come in, but so does biology, but not in the Aristotelian format. So that is in line with, uh, with a number of other virtue ethics thinkers that like Elizabeth Anscombe, whom I've mentioned, um, that wanted to return to Aristotle, but not everything, not completely, but to the Aristotelian spirit, but not embracing all of his metaphysics and certainly not embracing his uh, biology. But um, uh, he, again, Aquinas plays a role. This is the Aquinas, uh, this, this is the uh, Thomistic awakening that uh, uh, he finds that the, the, the role that it plays here is uh, Part two of the of the Summa, the second part, part two is divided into two parts. So the second part of the second part, um, question 30, which deals with the, uh, the notion of mercy, the virtue of mercy. And Aquinas goes in and has a, a very lengthy discussion 
about what virtue, uh, how the nature of the virtue, mercy, and, and defines it as this capacity, this heart capacity, the capacity in our heart for uh, another's misery. And so having this compassion in the heart, having the miserable heart, the misericordia in Latin, having the miserable heart is, uh, is, 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 is essential in trying to describe and have an ethical, in a loose sense, an ethical theory. So again, Aquinas is playing a role. So on a variety of, of, of levels, we have this uh, Aquinian awakening or the Thomistic group kind of awakening of McIntyre. And so the goal is like, how does this work in terms of virtue ethics? So, and of course, Aquinas uh, uh, has a full blown uh, virtue ethics and it's, but it's embedded again, like Aristotle's in, uh, in, in, in a religious or met, at least a metaphysical, but with Aquinas more of a religious framework. So we'll, we'll see what, how that works. So those were some of the things he says to, uh, that, that he learned also, although, we started off by saying that he didn't really think any of the criticisms would lead him to abandon the original and main ideas of uh, after virtue. He, he does take some things up from what people have said. Sometimes, uh, it, McIntyre says, you know, people will point out certain things that you didn't really realize. And and if you go on and, and you go on YouTube and you look at uh, McIntyre, there's lots of him, lots of lectures of his. And he often begins his lectures by uh, by saying, you know, he'd like to thank some of his critics who probably understand and can think his stuff better than he can. I, it's a little bit of a joke, but sometimes, you know, some of these major figures will make these comments that, that their critics have helped them understand their own work even better. Hey, that's not a surprise. You know, an author, novelist is not always the best interpreter of, of a novel. Um, so the, the critics have helped him. Um, and even if it's to the point of where he resists what they're trying to say. Um, a number of criticism, so one of the criticisms was that, look, after virtue is just this big nostalgia, you know, you, you, you want to go back to Aristotle, you want to go way back to Aquinas and Aristotle, you know, real old conservative stuff, really, you want to do that? Um, McIntyre, you know, says that, you know, he, he's not trying to idealize the past, he denies being, a, you know, an idealist about the past, but he says that we need to understand ourselves in, in the light of, of the Aristotelian tradition to help us to overcome the limitations of other traditions. But he says, you know, we can't, we just can't escape our place in time, our place in history. And he admits that his, his understanding of Aristotelianism is historically conditioned. So he's not saying that he's a perfect interpreter. He's a product of history as well. And he doesn't think that his criticisms and his commentaries on the Aristotelian tradition as a mode of, as a way to understand other traditions is something that's atemporal because he is, he admits that uh, he has learned from uh, a modern understanding of history and he's learned from the likes of people like Vico, uh, R.G. Collingwood, and John Henry Newman. So he, his own understanding is not a nostalgia for the past, but it's a deeper understanding in a historical sense of what the past really was. It's not an attempt to just simply return to it. He thinks that there's a richness that has been lost, but we're going to appropriate it as modern individuals. We can't go back and be medieval or ancient. That's, there, there's, there's no sense in that, you can't do it. You're a product of your own time. And so what, what's a big takeaway that, that McIntyre learned? Well, of course, it's the, uh, 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 the situatedness, you know, it, it, of, of all inquiry. Uh, the standards of, justi of, of justification, rationality vary from time to time, and nobody has access to standards that would be uh, perfect for solving problems in a completely neutral fashion. That is an old fiction. Um, of course, the minute you start talking like that, uh, philosophers are going to are, are going to say, "Well, that's just relativism. Well, you know, you're you're just exposing relativism, and and that's fine. You know, but but." You know, when you, once you say that it's all relative to traditions, time and place, it, it's a form of relativism. Magnair tries to wiggle off that, that hook. I'm not sure he's entirely successful, but we'll give him the benefit of the doubt of giving it a good try. Um, he, he is talking about, you know, yes, you can't analyze uh, traditions from outside of traditions. You have to analyze them in, in with, from within traditions, but... Um, not every tradition is going to be as fruitful. So there's a kind of pragmatic dimension going on 
uh, have flavor to it that a good basis tradition uh, you know like a good basis tradition will allow the adherence of that tradition to exercise what uh, McIntyre likes to call the philosophical imagination so McIntyre is definitely influenced a lot by literature he's not a strict analytic philosopher in that sense of the term um, rigorous though his arguments often are he does take inspiration clearly from poetry and, and literature as as well but this notion of a tradition being rich enough to provide uh, one with the ability to develop the philosophical uh, imagination, which he thinks you find in the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, but not so much in the others, um, that allows him to escape that it's just any tradition goes. And no, it's not. Some traditions are richer and deeper than, than others. And so in this sense, that the people that adhere to the rich and deep tradition, of course, in this sense, it's McIntyre picking the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, um, they can have a deeper understanding of the other traditions than those traditions can understand uh, those of, of, of the Aristotelian tradition. So in other words, Aristotelians and Thomists can better understand Kantians than Kantians can uh, the reverse. And so there's a connection there back to metaphysics because it gives you a larger framework of interpretation. So in that sense that, uh, that the people of these deeper traditions have a better chance of solving the problems that emerge in the other traditions. Um, and McIntyre admits this is not a knockdown argument. He's already said that, you know, he's not expecting that people of uh, adherence of other traditions are simply going to say, yes, you're an Aristotelian Thomist and you were right. But nonetheless, he, he tries to provide some justification that it's not just anything goes, but there's not complete neutrality either. Um, so the big takeaway then is that it takes a rich and complex tradition to form the basis for analyzing and, use McIntyre's terms, ultimately defeating one. So if we really want to overcome all the problems that have been generated by this loss of context, remember we talked about that great disaster of modernity, the, uh, uh, is this culture of, of advanced modernity, it's going to take a very rich and deep tradition. And the one we have, at least in the West, that McIntyre picks up on is the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition. So that's the big uh, uh, takeaway. It's that's going to be what's going to defeat the others. It's not going to be some great knockdown argument. And of course, the adherence of that tradition, he doesn't expect them to just you know admit that, that they lost the battle. So... How, how do you analyze this? Well, you follow the, 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 the general argument of the book and, and see how it, it, it strikes you. Um, McIntyre also uh, analyzes a few other things where some people accused him uh, or said to him, you know, his critique of liberalism, that he was ultimately a communitarian. He denies that. McIntyre does not think that all communities are intrinsically good. He you know, says lots of communities are terrible, they're oppressive and whatnot. So community for the sake of community, I'm not a communitarian, he says. Um, McIntyre, of course, is, 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 is a critic of, of liberalism, right? He doesn't like liberalism's, uh, uh, the, the essence of liberalism, of course, is there's no public conception of the good, experiments in living, as Mill would say, and the, as McIntyre says, this excessive concentration and focus on the individual. McIntyre doesn't like that. So, but then people say, well, okay, um, you're not a communitarian or, 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 and you're not embracing liberalism, so you must be some kind of conservative. And McIntyre says, you know, no, I'm not that either, because, uh, you know, he's not a fan of, of regulating life and human life by, uh, by economic markets. He said, this is basically just another version of the emphasis on the individual uh, albeit constructed through market forces. So he's basically denying the being a member of these larger type categories. So, so much for communitarianism, liberalism and conservatism, he's turning to the virtue ethics tradition. So a virtue ethicist. Um, and also when, when do the, the virtues really come alive? It's not in academia, it's not in, in any place, but in the ordinary lives of uh, civilians and this is where you have a, a regeneration of the values of the and the virtues of this virtue ethics tradition so that basically wraps up uh, the the prologue but uh, i just want to end on this little note that mcintyre ends on and he says not only do i have 
uh, the the sort of the debts, intellectual debts to the tradition, to, you know, his heroes, Aristotle and, of course, Aquinas. And, of course, you know, the, the, the influence of, of Kant and all the, uh, all the other great thinkers. He acknowledges, in addition to the debts of uh, the intellectual debts, the debts of the imagination. And he refers to a, a very interesting science fiction novel, which he says frames uh, the, the beginning of it. And it's this novel came out in the 50s, a great work in the history of science fiction. Um, and he says that, that the, the, the situation that's described in this novel is essentially what he was trying to describe of the situation in, in ethics, a post kind of apocalypse, right? This science fiction novel begins after a nuclear war, everything's blown to bits. And, uh, and that's all people have are bits of knowledge. They have, you know, imagine if all your physics textbooks were blown as to, to tiny bits and you just have little equations, you don't know how anything links up. You're trying to study engineering and all you have is the odd circuit diagram. You don't know what any of the of the symbols mean. This is what uh, McIntyre thinks that we're in with regards to ethics, that the whole system has been blown to bits and we just have these concepts all over the place and we're scrambling to try and put them back together. Uh, McIntyre does acknowledge a few other debts to poetry, so he thinks that there, there's much more going on in ethical life than simply the, the intellectual debts. As important as they may be to the philosophical tradition, they're not the complete story. So there you go. That's the beginning of it. Let's now turn to the actual situation of, uh, that McIntyre thinks we're involved in and see where he takes us.